Hey, Rock Valley Chapel, this is Pastor Tim, and I'm um, just getting going here on the next installment of our Ecclesiastes Bible study, and today we're going to be breaking into chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9, and they are incredibly relevant for what we are going through, uh, not only in the, the COVID-19 crisis that we're, um, that we're all enduring globally, but at this exact time when governors and the president of the United States and other world leaders are wrestling with the question about when to reopen in light of um, the nature of the spread of the virus. So um, I'm pretty excited because I think these nine verses uh, might give us something to think about as we ourselves process what our leaders are going through. So let me read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Verses 1 to 9. Who is like the wise, and who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the hardness of his face is changed. I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. For the word of the king is supreme, and who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing, and the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's trouble lies heavy on him. For he does not know what is to be, for who can tell him how it will be? No man has power to retain the spirit or power over the day of death. There is no discharge from war, nor will wickedness deliver those who are given to it. All this I observed while applying my heart to all that is done under the sun, when man had power over man to his hurt. Great stuff for what we're looking at, again, as I mentioned, in our world today. I don't know about you, but I feel, I feel really bad. I feel sorry for President Trump, for our own governor, Tony Evers, for all the governors, for all the world leaders, because I think they're all in a lose-lose situation, quite honestly. If you open up the economy too quickly, too many people will be exposed to COVID-19 you risk the possibility of a rebound of infections, which could be even worse, some are suggesting, in this first wave that we've endured, and people will die. On the other hand, if you don't open up the economy, people are still going to suffer and they're going to die because people will be without work. Depression is increasing incredibly. Suicide rates are increasing. Home battery calls to police officers are increasing. There are all kinds of troubles. One in seven Americans now, as, uh, as we speak at this moment, uh, have signed up for unemployment, and more are on the way. So there's all kinds of economic, social, and personal distress. And so our leaders are in a, a no-win situation. They either choose the COVID-19 path or they choose the economic distress path. They're taking risks no matter what they do. And of course, their opponents, no matter what side of the political aisle they're on, are going to critique them harshly now and certainly the next time they run for re-election. And in the case of President Trump, of course, this is an election year, so every move he makes is going to be scrutinized. And our own Governor Evers is a couple years away from his re-election, so he's, he's got a little bit of a buffer. But mark my words, whoever runs against him will remember some of the decisions he's made uh, to this point or not made. And so our leaders are just in a bind, every one of them, no matter what your political aff affiliation is. And so let me just remind you all to pray for them, that they would have wisdom. And this section here, that we're looking at in Ecclesiastes 8 is really all about rulers, about kings, about people who have authority. And it starts out in verse 1 with, who is like the wise and who knows the interpretation of a thing? 
when a man's wisdom occurs, his face shines and therefore it's not distorted. I think we all know what it feels like to be that person who's had insight on a particular matter, no matter what it is, whether it's a family decision, a decision at work, maybe a decision that impacts church. Um, as a former elected official myself, there have been times uh, in the past where we made decisions and only later did it turn out to be the right thing. Um, and you feel really good when you know you've made the right decision, you weighed all the evidence, you've prayed it through, you've thought it through, you've consulted with others, you make your best decision, and when it turns out to be right and other people call you wise because of the decision you make, it makes you feel good. And as the text says here, it makes your face shine. I like that. Conversely, when we make the wrong decision, and it turns out that everyone says, how could you possibly have thought through that like that? Well, there are letters to the editor that critique our uh, decisions. There are people that send nasty emails and phone calls. And trust me, I've experienced them all. I've even experienced them as a pastor in ways that you could not, could not possibly believe. Well, when that happens, our faces turn hard. We get contorted and we look inward and we're, we're upset. And so the, the message here in verse 1 is, boy, it's nice when we are right. It's nice when wisdom is our friend. And um, it's not so nice when wisdom is not with us. And the idea seems to be, let's hope that wisdom is the friend of our leaders. And right now our leaders need that wisdom. This, this passage reminds me of Romans 13. Um, I'm going to turn there real quickly and just read through part of this. Uh, Paul writes in Romans 13, I'm going to look at about four or five verses here. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad conduct. Excuse me, bad conduct. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Well, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And so... Paul is trying to say that governing authorities are there by God's institution. God is the one who has put them there, and when, when you resist the government authorities, you are, in effect, risking, um, or excuse me, resisting God, and risking, um, at resistance, you are risking punishment that will come from the hand of the governing authorities, but that punishment will, by implication, be approved by God because he is the one who has put the authorities there in the first place. So it's a strong argument for Christians to submit to their governing authorities. And, of course, we do that uh, within parameters, within boundaries. Uh, whenever our religious freedoms or our right to worship the Lord freely are challenged, then, of course, it's, it's time to resist and uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about when it's appropriate for Christians to resist governing authorities. But the main message is governing authorities are ultimately there for our good, and to resist them is to resist God and to incur punishment on ourselves. And this is kind of what we see back in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 8. Keep the king's commandment, it says, in verse 2, because of God's oath to him, that is, God's behind him, he's supporting him. Be not hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever he pleases. The authority has tremendous amount of power, and they can do with their power what they please, whether it's going to be in harmony with God's will or not, and we know this. As we look around our nation, we see various governors taking different kind of approaches to um, how they're um, issuing stay-at-home orders. Some have extended, like in our state, Wisconsin has 
extended the stay-at-home orders to May 26th, so they were due to expire this coming Friday, April 24th, and Governor Evers extended them to May 26th. We are now the second uh, longest waiting state, if you will. I don't think I said that really well, but we're the second longest um, state in terms of its stay-at-home orders. Uh, The first one is Virginia. They have extended their stay-at-home orders to June 10th. And then the next one is Wisconsin at May 26th. To this point, all other states have um, expiration dates prior to May 26th. Now, I suspect that many of the states will extend their stay-at-home orders, and they may go beyond even May 26th. But as it stands now, uh, we are in stay-at-home orders until May 26th unless circumstances change. Uh, And then Governor Evers, of course, could... um, modify his dates and back that up a little bit. But in the meantime, uh, we are to submit to those orders, the stay-at-home orders to May 26th. And of course, this is a whole lot easier for people to stomach if they have income. Um, If somebody's retired and they're still able to draw on income, that's different than somebody who's trying to feed a family and who's out of work and maybe um, is having a hard time getting that unemployment check delivered on time. Um, or even getting an application filled out. These are very trying times for so many people. And so it's much harder for them to stomach some of these stay-at-home orders and much easier to say, yeah, we'll just submit to the government. But maybe the government is exercising poor judgment. These are the kinds of challenges that we face as Christians. And yet at the end of the day, I think verse 6 really gives us the wisdom that we need. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's troubles lies heavily on him. So there's a proper time in verse 5 to respond to our authorities. There is a time and a season for rebellion. There's a time and a season for speaking out, sending out a petition. Um, As we've seen in several states, there have been protests that... Um, the government's offices, or even at governor's mansions, I think, in uh, some states. Protests all over the country. I know of one, obviously, in Michigan we've seen. Uh, There's one that I heard about in Colorado. Uh, I suspect there are two or three other states where there are these protests because people want to be released from these stay-at-home orders so they can get out and work and start to earn income. So the Christian, as they assess what's going on, needs to recognize, just as we see in verse 5, that there's a proper time and a just way for us to lodge our concerns. And so I would encourage Christians uh, who are listening to this in Rock Valley Chapel to, on the one hand, remember that God has instituted government ultimately for our good. And insofar as our religious freedom is not being abused, insofar as we are not denied the opportunity to worship God, we need to recognize that everything else, in a, in a sense, is secondary. And that's why we have here language in this, um, this section in Ecclesiastes about war. We have language in here about evil being done under the sun. We have language about evil rulers hurting human beings. All kinds of leaders make decisions that hurt people. We know that. We've all experienced that over the years. We've suffered as a result of it, but they've mostly made decisions that are designed for our good. And even though government operates out of what we might call a teleological uh, morality, that is to say, making decisions for the greatest good, for the greatest number of people, um, At the end of the day, that seems to be most of the time their goal, to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Now, that kind of approach to morality is not grounded necessarily in a biblical uh, framework of morality, but it is designed ultimately for our good, and that's what Paul tells us in Romans, that government is there instituted by God. So as we suffer through this COVID-19 trial, and as we all suffer economically, socially, uh, physically with our health and emotionally, um, let's be reminded that God is sovereign. None of this surprises him. 
there's going to be good that comes out of this, as we were talking about yesterday in uh, yesterday's message on Sunday, that we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So let's ground ourselves in that truth first. That God will work all things together for good. That is to say, for his good, for his greater glory, for the things that matter most to him, even though they might not be the things that matter most to us, at least in a material context. Let us ground our view of government in Romans 8, 28 first. Then let's ask ourselves if our religious freedoms are being compromised, challenged, or removed from us. And even though we have stay-at-home orders, I have to say, by God's grace, we're able to continue to worship, even though it's uh, live streaming and it's not all together, but we're still able to get God's word out there, and the government is not shutting us down. It is putting some restrictions in terms of number of people and uh, meeting together at church, and we understand that, but we can still worship, we can still pray, we can still read our Bibles, we can, our, our whole um, effort at following the Lord as disciples of Jesus Christ has not been completely removed, and in my way of looking at what's happening right now, um, it is not an unreasonable um, demand for the government to say that no groups of 10 or more should be meeting together. I don't think it's unreasonable because of public safety. And I say that simply because we still have the opportunity and the privilege of being able to worship freely. At the same time, it's it's hard to say when um, the government is uh, closing us in with these stay-at-home orders for too long. It's hard to find that balance, I have to say. And we all would have our own opinion but remember this, and again, speaking as a former elected official myself, very few of us ever have access to all the information that our leaders do. And if we did, we might rethink our opinions that are based often on what we hear on the radio or read in the newspaper or from our neighbors. So let us remember what Paul has to say, that government is ultimately there for our good and placed there by God. Let us be thankful that we still have the right to read our Bibles. We still have the right to pray. We still have the right to watch our church services, albeit online. We still have the right to get out of our house and go to the grocery store and take walks. We are not totally contained. And let's give our government leaders a little bit of slack. Let's cut them a little bit of slack because they are really in a no-win proposition. And I think for the most case... They're looking to try to keep us safe, all the while trying to open us up as quickly as they possibly can, knowing that there's a great amount of damage that is happening in the meantime. So pray for our leaders. Keep praying for those in our church who are suffering in our community. Do what we can to come alongside and mitigate some of the pain that we see around us. Um, but at the end of the day, recognize that God is sovereign and he will work all things together for good for his ultimate glory. I pray you have a great day. God bless you.